The Americans could have been the first in space, but American doctors, those doctors, were worried about what the effects of space would have on human beings. And they were nervous that guys could maybe die if they went. They wanted to send many, many, many monkeys. Well, one guy even joked that they should move the NASA program to Africa if they were to send so many monkeys. But the fact is, Yuri Gagarin turned out to be the monkey. He went up, he went around the Earth, he survived. One month later, the Americans went. But Yuri Gagarin was to Americans what Derek Jeter is to Red Sox. He's respected, but nobody wants him. <laughs> it's really amazing to me how 40, 50 years later, you find Beatles songs everywhere around you. Now, of course, you have to be somewhat familiar with Beatles songs to pick up on. But once you know the Beatles songs, they are absolutely everywhere. You can go out today to the grocery store and pick up a box of strawberry fields. <laughs> if you read Time Magazine, you can get back. You can also get back. <laughs> <laughs> right? this, is, this is on Amazon. Anytime there's a, there's a Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, don't be surprised to find this. I've just picked a few. If there's an article about the sun, sun flares, solar eclipses, what are you going to get? Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. But this is a popular one. You see it all the time. This is the uh, First Lady of France, Carla Sarkozy. Revolution, needless to say, shows up in countless places. I'm not going to show you all the examples. Anybody read Sports Illustrated? Uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is a favorite. Okay? Planet in the Sky, Carrie in the Sky, Lucy in the Sky with Therapist. <laughs> Can't buy me love. Uh, Any time articles on social media, Facebook, politicians, can't buy me love. Psychology, politics. Hey, anybody know Michelle Bachman? She's here, there, and everywhere. What album? I could be on the tape. Better brush up on that. <laughs> anybody read Time Magazine? This was just a few months ago, the weekly news. Anybody recognize this song? You do if you have rock band. <laughs> uh, a day in the life is very popular. It usually doesn't say a day in the life the way it does here. Instead, it says, I read the news today. Or, I read the news today, oh boy. So, what I'd like to 
do, since you already know all the major facts about the Beatles, I'm going to do sort of a, a letterman type thing, top ten stories. And what I'm going to do is go pick stories that have a story behind the story. So you may sort of know the story, but there's often a story behind it, which makes it even more interesting. I'm going to mix the Beatles and the Race to the Moon, sort of a little bit like in the book. So, anybody ever recognize this guy? Gus Grissom. He was the second American to go up in space. So, there is a famous story, if you read The Right Stuff, or if you saw the movie The Right Stuff, his, uh, his space flight is a cannon launch. He goes up in space, and he comes down. And what happened when he splashed down? Anybody see the movie? The hatch opens unexpectedly. Water starts to pour into the capsule. So what does he do? He has to jump out because the capsule is sinking. Wasn't the hatch wasn't supposed to open like that. So the helicopter is hovering above, ready to pick up the capsule with Grissom in it. Grissom's not in the capsule. Grissom is, has just jumped out. Well, the capsule is filling with water, so it becomes heavier and heavier. The, cap, the helicopter grabs the capsule, but the capsule is sinking because it's getting so heavy. So the helicopter guys, the pilot, they turn on the power to the max, and little by little, they're able to lift this capsule out of the water. What happens once it's out of the water? It's not buoyant anymore. So now it's even heavier. So now it starts to sink again, and it's dragging the helicopter down. So all the lights go on in the cockpit of the helicopter. The wheels are in the water. The pilots realize they got to ditch the capsule. So they drop the capsule. It drops at the bottom of the ocean. And then they decide, where's Chris? Well, Chris, in the meantime, because of the backwash, because of the, because of the propellers, the waves are pouring into his spacesuit. Now, he's starting to weigh a ton. He can barely keep his head above the waves. He's drowning. These are not endurance athletes. These are top, top, top pilots. But these guys aren't athletes. In fact, all these guys used to smoke. So he is not in any kind of shape to be treading water with a suit full of water. Anyway, he's moments away from going under with the capsule. And the guys flying to see him, and they they all that. Well, we came very close to having our first fatality with just our second flight. And that might have been the end of the space program right there. Because then, as now, a big chunk of Congress wanted to cut the budget and cut out NASA altogether. So you think it's bad today, or it's just as bad back then? Then we'll switch to the people. Now, you all know I want to hold your hands. So the story is it's a big hit in, it's a big hit in England, and it comes to America, and it's a big hit over here, which is an unusual. But there's a story behind this story. The fact is, the president of Capitol Records in America hated the Beatles. He didn't like the way they sounded. He didn't like the way they looked with their ridiculous hair that made them look like the Three Stooges. And he didn't like their name. Having said that, the Capitol Records had tried some rock and roll in the 50s, and they had chosen poorly, and they hadn't done it. So, not only did Alan Livingston not like the Beatles, but Capitol Records hadn't done well with rock and roll. And they had just seen another band that started with the letters B and A, which was the Beach Boys. And the Beach Boys were local. They were from California, which is where Capitol Records were. So Capitol had its nod to the teenage market. But there were a few things that Alan Livingston couldn't ignore. He couldn't ignore these numbers. He couldn't ignore the extraordinary success that the Beatles were having in England. In a country that just had a third of the American market, the Beatles by themselves were practically selling more songs than the entire American market. And whether he liked the Beatles or not, he did care about the bottom line. And the Beatles were coming to America. They had an Ed Sullivan date on February 9, 1964. So putting all that together, Alan Livingston finally gave him. He said, okay, we'll bring out one of Ultra Hand to it. And of course, the rest is history. But it wasn't so easy. When they had a number one hit in England, what was their first hit? Please, please make them. Alan Livingston wasn't interested. Now what was their second hit? From me to you. Alan Livingston wasn't interested. 
What was there third? She loves you. Major hit, not just in England, but throughout Europe. Alan Livingston wasn't interested. And finally, their fourth hit, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and this is the story behind the story. Now, when you study the Beatles, and especially if you're in a music department, you're going to be focused on the music. And yes, I think you can make a case for the Beatles being the greatest band ever if you just look at the music. But there's a whole other aspect to the Beatles that really has nothing to do with the music when it comes to, to impact. The Beatles came in with what was considered then long hair. Every guy today who likes to wear his hair a little bit on the long side owes a debt of gratitude to the Beatles. So here's the question. How many barbershops closed in the years following the Beatles' arrival in America? What would your guess be? 5%? 10%? So that's what you call impact. Wow. And it's still true today. It's for every guy who likes to wear his hair short, there's another guy who sort of likes to wear his hair like the Beatles. So that is a cultural impact that is just hard to ignore, whether you like their music or not. This is the top 10 moment, as far as I'm concerned. It would seem obvious that all the critics love the Beatles. Not true. When the Beatles arrived, the critics universally hated the Beatles. Take a look at this. So when the Beatles arrived, before A Hard Day's Night came out, this is what the New York Times had to say. This is what Newsweek had to say. W.E.W. in New York City, now the home of rock and roll. Not then. Then, the movie comes out. And the movie is a great success. Even, uh, even the critics like it. But what I think is funny is that all the reviews start like this. You're not going to believe it. I couldn't resist. I can't believe, my, I can't believe I'm saying this, etc., etc. This is going to surprise you. So the same critics who thought the Beatles were awful when they arrived, when the movie came out, suddenly, no pun intended, they were singing a different tune. <laughs> so for me, it's a top 10 moment, because that's when the critics finally came aboard and said, OK, this is not just for teenagers. These guys, these, these guys might be good. These guys just might be good. All right, switching back to space. The first American in space was Ed White. Now, astronauts go up all the time to the space station, so you don't think twice about it. But you can imagine the first time somebody wanted to space, people were very anxious. I mean, the thought was he's going to, they're going to open the capsule and the guy's going to die. Something is going to explode, he's going to die. Man isn't meant to be floating in the vacuum of space, in the five thousand degrees below zero. Something bad is going to happen. So it took a lot of courage for somebody to do that. And that guy was Ed White. And he and his partner, Nick Dillard, took beautiful pictures that were broadcast all around the world. Man walks in space. That's the story. Now, behind the story, he nearly died. Not because he was in space. Anybody know why he nearly died? He couldn't get back in the capsule. Any idea why he couldn't get back in? Because he was in the vacuum of space, and his suit inflated a little more, just from the vacuum. And it made him bigger. He started to be a little, even more of a Michelin. And he couldn't fit in the door of the Gemini capsule. He was going to die. It was going to be a long, lonely road back for Big Dippin. McDivitt was going to have to cut the cord and let Ed White die because he couldn't get back in. And he was getting all sweaty and perspiring and his heart rate was going up. And he could see that his life was about to end after a glorious, easy, fun-loving walk in space. So what did Ed White do? What would you do? You're floating in space and you're going to die if you don't get back in. This was not part of the NASA script. You know, they have all these contingency plans.
didn't do something. So he opened the valve for a moment, he didn't explode, and he got back in. Now, the story behind the story behind the story is he wasn't the first guy up to walk in space. Who was the first guy to walk in space? Alexei Leonov, the Russian. The same Russians who beat us in space, they also had the first guy to walk in space. And what problem do you think Leonov had two months before? The same thing. Couldn't get back in. What did Leonov do when he realized he was going to die? Opened the valve and he got back in. Now you might say, well, how stupid was Ed White? I mean, you see what happened to Leonov. How do you let that happen to you? And when it happens to you, why don't you just open your space suit and stop getting so upset? So, what do you think happened? Why? The Americans and the Russians didn't talk. The Russians weren't about to tell you that Leonov had a problem. They just told you that he walked in space and that it was a tremendous success. So the Americans had no idea Leonov had that. Mind you, the press had a very cozy relationship with NASA and they only told you what NASA wanted you to hear. They didn't want their phone to come So nobody in America knew that they didn't quite have a problem either. They just knew it was spectacular. Gordon Cooper had an interesting set of flights. He was also one of the Mercury astronauts. He was the last Mercury astronaut. In fact, he was the last human being to fly by himself around the Earth. So he's going around in circles in orbit. And on his 19th orbit, you could say his 19th nervous breakdown, but that's another lecture. <laughs> uh, what happens? All the systems start to go off. Everything. So he's going to come down on his own from space without any help from NASA, just using his wristwatch and the stars for alignment and the radio. And he makes it down. He makes it down just five miles from where he was supposed to land, even though he had no help whatsoever. That's the story. The story behind the story is what happened to the capsule? Why did all the systems go out? So they said no. And 
Finley said, I'll offer you today's dollars. I'll offer you another million dollars just to play that one song. No, I'll offer you another two million, three million, four million. Finally, it became obvious that the Beatles weren't going to do it. Fine. The day of the concert comes and they play their standard 30 minute set. The crowd is delirious. And at the end, after they've taken their bow, John Lennon says, and by the way, you've been such great fans, we would like to play one more song. Paul McCartney goes, ah, uh, Kansas City. <laughs> they played the song for free. <laughs> they weren't going to be bought, but they were happy to do it for the fans. So I love that particular story, because to me, that's a top ten moment, because it gives you a sense of the character of the people you were dealing with. Recognize these guys? You maybe recognize one of them. So the guy on the right is Neil Armstrong, the first guy to walk on the moon. The guy on the left is Dave Scott. You have a connection? What? You have a connection to Neil? Well, I went to Purdue when he's up way over here. Right. Uh, you know what? A tremendous number of astronauts went to Purdue. The first guy to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong, went to Purdue. The last guy to walk on the moon, uh, Gene Cernan, went to Purdue. Roger Chaffee. Apollo 1 went to Purdue. There's one other guy who went to Purdue. Oh, Gus Brissett. Gus Brissett went to Purdue. So a lot of these guys went to Purdue. No question about it. The guy on the left also walked on the moon. He was the first guy to drive on it. He was the first guy to drive that little lunar rover on the moon. But the story behind the story is these two guys nearly didn't survive their first flight, which was Jenna Ahey. Their mission was to dock with a rocket in space. Now, astronauts do that all the time today, but no one had ever docked two spacecraft. And the physics of docking in space are very complicated. So these guys went up, and they were able to dock. And so the mission was a tremendous success. So the, this capsule is docked to this big, long rocket. And then the two rockets, the command, Gemini caps on the rocket, drifted to the nighttime of Earth. Now in those days, you didn't have communication satellites. These days, you know, you got a GPS. Type of thing. In those days, you had a dozen tracking stations around the Earth, so that the astronauts would go through long periods of time without being in touch with anybody on the ground. And of course, you know Murphy's Law, bad things would always happen when they were just out of touch. So Armstrong and Scott are out of touch in the nighttime sky. Part of the Earth, so they can't see it. And what starts to happen? It starts to turn like a pig on a barbecue, very slow. And then they start to spin faster and faster. So Armstrong thinks maybe the problems with the rocket, they just dock, so they undock. Now it happens. It starts to spin even faster. So now it starts to look like those centrifuge exercises that they put the astronauts. So now it's for real. They're spinning. And they're spinning faster and faster. And he's on the verge of passing out when he flips off the switch and suddenly it stops spinning. And when he turns on the switch, it starts spinning. So obviously the problem is with that switch. And they realize that one of the thrusters is stuck on the on position. So anytime he powers up the capsule, the capsule is going to start spinning. So they have to come down and you step. And they use the little retro rockets that they use position themselves for re-entry to get down. Instead of landing in the Atlantic, they land in the Pacific. But at least they're alive. They're alive to go walk on the moon. But they keep this close to not surviving that event. That is the story behind the story. Best familiar with this one? Yeah. So the reason I picked this song as a top ten moment is because I remember when that song came out. I was a kid. And that was the first time that my favorite band got any recognition from my parents. And I think it was the, when this song came out, that was when the over 30 crowd, in the old people, that was the first time the over 30 crowd was willing to recognize, okay, just like the critics have done through the hard days night, now the general population can see that even though they didn't like their long hair, they had to admit that they could write songs. And this is appropriate that they'd be only Paul on the cover, because none of the other Beatles had anything to do with the recording, as you probably know. And when they would play it in concert,
concert, the other guys would go off the stage and it would just be Paul. And one, once, it was funny, but Lennon said, and now I'd like to introduce to you Ringo. <laughs> great story because there's a real life lesson for all of us. You never know what's going to be good news and what's going to be bad. You know, you get a piece of bad news and you're very sad, but then it turns out later on that that really wasn't such bad news after all. You know, that really worked out for the better. And unfortunately, sometimes the reverse is true. You get some great news, but then after a while, it's like, well, maybe it wasn't such great news. Well, Buzz Aldrin is the perfect epitome. He goes to MIT, he's a PhD. His specialty is rendezvous techniques in space. He gets selected to be an astronaut. And you can imagine how excited he must have been the day he got that letter saying he was picked to be an astronaut. Unfortunately, he doesn't get any assignments. The only assignment he gets is to be the backup of Gemini 10, which means he would have been the astronaut for Gemini 13, except there was no Gemini 13 planet. So here he was, backing up Gemini 10, and that would have been the end of Buzz But one man's misery is another man's happiness. Because these guys who were slaves to uh, fly Gemini 9, I know that's complicated. What happens to these two guys? They're in a training plane together, they crash their plane, they die. And if you want to hear something ironic, you know where they crash their plane? They crashed their plane into the factory that was making their Gemini capsule. Anyway, these guys died. So now the guys on the bottom here, Gene Cernan, who went to work here, Gene Stanier, uh, Cernan, and Tom Stafford get to be the Gemini 9 astronaut. Buzz Aldrin is now the backup for 9. That puts him in position to be the astronaut for Gemini 12, the last Gemini, with Jim Lowe. And Buzz Aldrin does a good job. So that puts him into the Apollo program, which now puts him in position to be part of the first expedition to the moon. It's like good news, bad news, good news. You just never know which way it's going to go. So the bottom line is, if you get bad news, don't be too despondent. You just never know. It may turn out to be You know the story about John Lennon saying the Beatles, whatever, which is so this happens to be the article, I know it doesn't show up, it's well here. But it, it showed up in this teen magazine, Dick, which nobody over the age of 14 would read. But nevertheless, it caused the fewer that you know about. And John Lennon has signed it here at the top. And interestingly enough, he has signed it John C. Lennon. What's his real middle image? W. Winston. But he didn't sign it, John W. He signed it, John C. All right, this is a top 10 moment, but it's a negative one, unfortunately. If you're a Beatles fan, this is a very dark day <laughs> in the history of the Beatles. Uh, they were a very odd couple. They, they released an album of various sounds. This is the back of the album. You know what the front of the album looks like? <laughs> Uh, and when John Lennon was shot, this is the picture that Yoko Ono chose to give Rolling Stone magazine as the cover, tribute, picture to John Lennon. Not John Lennon the Beatle, not John Lennon the father, not John Lennon the husband. No, this. I don't think this was a very normal relationship. I mean, granted, who, who am I to say what's normal, right? Each to his own. But even so, if you have a bell curve, you know, and at the end of the bell curve, you're sort of not normal statistically. <laughs> this was not a normal relationship. I don't think Yoko was responsible for the Beatles breaking up. I mean, they were in their late 20s. They'd been together since they were 15. It's like army buddies. It's time to just move on. But Yoko, I think, kept them from ever getting back together. All right, anybody know what happened in January 67? That's a big day. So it's a big day. Mm -hmm. Apollo 1. So, Apollo 1. The guy on the left here is Gus Grissom, right? The guy who nearly drowned. 
And the guy on the right is Ed White, the first guy to walk in space who couldn't get back in the capsule. And Roger Chaffee, Purdue graduate, was a rookie, had never been in space. These guys were going to fly the first Apollo 1 mission. They were going to take the Apollo capsule around the Earth and check it out. So, I'm Jen, and here they are. This is a funny picture because Gus Wilson is very short and Ed White is very tall. But you wouldn't know it from this picture. So he must be sitting on a very high, he must be sitting on a few phone books. This is by far the shortest of the three. Anyway, here they are in their in the command module, with Grissom on the right, and Ed White in the middle, and Chaffee. Now they are, this is what's, this is a dress rehearsal for the flight, which is going to take place in a month. So they are in the capsule. The capsule is sitting on top of a Saturn rocket. All the launch conditions are going to be simulated except for one thing. There's no fuel in the Saturn rocket. So it's a pretty safe day. It's not considered a high risk day. There's no fuel for miles around. They're just sitting in the capsule. But what happens? There's a spark. The capsule is not filled with air. It's filled with oxygen. It's not just filled with oxygen. It's filled with oxygen under high pressure. What happens? But two seconds, it looks like this, and it looks like that, and then you got this. So in the space of 30 seconds, these three guys are dead. We have lost our first astronauts. They're not even in space. It's not even a high-risk day. It's just another day of going to the office. But we've lost Gus Grissom, who was a Mercury astronaut and a household name, and we've lost Ed White known to everybody as the first guy in America to walk in space. Roger Chaffee was not a known entity. But Gus Grissom and Ed White, I mean, that's like Justin Timberlake, you know, I mean, was, these guys were household names, you know, and they were now gone. So that was a momentous day, and nobody flew in space for a year and a half. Now, if you go to the Kennedy Space Center, all you see that's left of that launch site is this. And this plaque, which is hard to read. Now imagine a, a civilization, a thousand years from now, coming to, uh, from outer space and going to the Kennedy Space Center. Do you think anyone would ever imagine what happened from just looking at this? It just looks like a slab of concrete. I mean, it's the most unimpressive thing you could ever see. And yet, on top of that, sat a 36-story Saturn rocket with a capsule at the top with three guys up. A little more cheerful, though. <laughs> uh, you all know about the Venus going into India. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on that. The, the key thing is they wrote all the songs from the White Album when they were in India. And the White Album today is the biggest selling album of the 60s. So if for no other reason, it was a significant impact. What I particularly like are things like this. <laughs> where, uh, anybody know how to wind down there in the middle of the field? That was Mia Farrow, a big time movie star at the time. She got to be on the cover of Mad Magazine. You could argue whether Apollo 8 was a bigger deal than Apollo 11 from the society's point. Apollo 11, these are the guys who first walked on the moon. Apollo, what did the Apollo 8 guys do? They were the first to go to the moon circle around. So I think it's worth discussing. Uh, and that's, that was the go that they got to be very understated statement. You know, NASA speak is like the pilots. They're talking a very understated way. Something dramatic could be going on. You would never know it from what they're saying. You are go for TLI means you are go for translunar injection. The Apollo 8 guys were going around the Earth once to check out all the systems. And Houston was getting them to go ahead to go into outer space. Now, this was the first time that a human being left Earth to go towards outer space. Into nothing, really. This was the ultimate quarterback bomb. Because when you think about it, the Earth is turning on itself, and the Earth is going across the sky. And the astronauts have to hit the moon, which is itself going across the sky. And it's a quarter million miles away. So it's exactly like football. The rocket isn't going to where the moon is. The rocket is going to where they think the moon is going to be three and a half minutes from now. That's what you call using, you know, your, your slide. 
in the days where people use slideshows. You can imagine the math that went into that. Now, to make it worse, they didn't want to hit the moon. What happened if they hit the moon? They were laughing at spaghetti or lasagna. So they wanted to arrive just 60 miles ahead of the moon so as to be caught in the moon's, in the moon's gravity and spin around. If they got there too soon, what would happen? would get picked up by the moon, and they would still be heading out to outer space as we talked today. And again, if they got there a little too late, stop. So that is a tremendous technological achievement and philosophical one when you they left, went into outer space. That's the story. The story behind the story. Have you ever seen this picture before? It's arguably the most famous picture ever. It's the Earthworks. The Apollo 8 astronauts were the first to ever see the Earth as a round ball, because you have to be far enough away to see Earth as a round ball. Now, you see this picture all the time, but no one had ever seen it before. No one had ever seen what Earth, what could Earth look like from outer space. So the Apollo 8 astronauts are going around the moon, and suddenly, what do they see? They see the Earth. No one had ever seen the Earth before. So, as Anger said, we went to explore the moon and we discovered the Earth. And they took this picture, which became instantly famous. And we found out stamps, it was the symbol of Earth Day. But the story behind the story behind the story is that the picture was really taken like this. Because they were going around the moon this way, so the, the lunar surface was vertical, and the, and the Earth was to the left. But to make it look more than to make it look more like an earth rise, the picture has since then been turned 90 degrees mm. so that it looks more the way we're familiar with it, which is like that. So if you look at the pictures in this book, the picture was really taken like that. Mm. You all know Apollo 11 night for the first time. Did you know they nearly didn't take off? They were supposed to land on something flat. They landed instead in a field of boulders, or what looked like a field of boulders. And they only had enough fuel to make it to their landing spot. So this is like arriving at your destination in a car, and your fuel gauge is on zero, and you realize you're not where you're supposed to be. But your fuel gauge is zero. That's a little problem, especially when you're on the moon. Now, had they landed on the boulders, they could have landed, and they might have conceivably walked, but they would have never been able to take off. Because if the lunar module were crooked, they would have never been able to get back into the water. They would have been the first to walk on the moon, and the first Dying. <laughs> Fortunately, with just fumes in the engine, Neil Armstrong was able to find a little space that was flat. Of course, it began to rest the system. So the next to last story I have is this. You're familiar with this album. It's become an iconic album. You find it everywhere. I went skiing in Snowbird. This is the decal we put on the album. Go to Philadelphia with the Independence Museum. Even our forefathers. <laughs> Both your legs are straight. 
And that's the only picture where they are all in the stance phase of game. Now, in the military parade, you expect that. But four guys randomly walking, you're not going to expect that. And that's why none of the pictures look like except for that one. And so it provides symmetry to the picture. So the last issue, Professor Trent Lee, the time you guys had a discussion about this. Just as the meetings were breaking up, and we're not even talking to each other anymore, out comes this rumor that Paul McCartney actually died in 1966. You're probably familiar with the clues. There are many books that have been written about all the clues. One book that I like is called The Walrus Was Paul. And it just goes through, clue after clue. And of course, that's where scholarship comes in. Cherry picking things that are convenient to your theory, to your theory does not constitute scholarly work. So if you have a pet theory, you can always go back and find things that will support your theory. That's how all conspiracy theories work. You have to look at things in totality. So yes, you can find clues that will fit the theory that Paul died in 1966. So Life Magazine went to find him in Scotland to interview him. Unfortunately, even though Paul McCartney is a very good-natured guy, the Beatles were just breaking up. He was very unhappy about that. He was in no mood to speak to any reporter about a silly rumor about him having died three years earlier. He kicked them out of the house. And then he thought twice about it, because he realized the negative publicity in the back of the So then he ran and invited them back in, and he let them take a few pictures. And that's what you see on the cover of Life Magazine. But the theory that really doesn't make any sense. It's like the theory that men never really laid on the moon. It was all poets. Yeah, like 400,000 people that it took to put this together. These 400,000 people for the last 40 years have been keeping a seat. I mean, you know, let's be realistic. So, you know, what are the odds that there was another guy who looked just like Paul McCartney had the same voice and was one in a zillion genius? I mean, honestly. And none of the other guys picked up on it. <laughs> or if they did, they took their secret to their grave, too. I mean, it's, just, it's amusing. It's a lot of fun. I highly recommend that you read some of those books just because it's fun. But other than that, I don't think you pay much attention. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you. Why would these two 
stores are in the DNA, why not Vietnam? You're right, because you know what? Initially, I had a third story. The original title of my book was in Into the Sky with Diamond, and even before it passed before the hive, it was going to be Apollo Beatles Bond. I bonded. It. And in fact, if you ever get around to the book, there are a lot of great behind the scenes stories on the James Bond. But James Bond doesn't end in 1970. And Vietnam didn't involve the whole 60s. It really started in the mid 60s. And then it went on into the 70s. So it's not just that they were in the 60s, it's that they started in the 60s, at the very beginning. They ended in the 70s, right at the beginning of the next decade. The race of the moon was over by 69, and the Beatles had disbanded by January 1st. I mean, it wasn't official until April, but they had disbanded by January 1st, 1970. So those two stories started and ended exactly at the same time. I mean, all, I won't keep you sitting here, but if you have a question, oh, what was the significance of your book? Have you noticed that the change is there? No, I don't. Living in New York, because he felt he could live in New York and nobody would bother him, as opposed to England. 
So he could be seen walking in Central Park with the Elko. He could be seen, he was very accessible that way. And people left him alone. It's not like people were robbing him. But here he was just walking into his building. You know, so I mean, it's not like he was looking for trouble. It was no different from you walking into your building. The guy was waiting for him. In fact, do you know, do you know what John Lennon's connection was with his killer a few hours earlier? The family yeah, signed the autograph. He had an autograph, but a picture for the guy. And then the guy hung around and came back and shot him. And it was just the most bizarre, just the most bizarre thing. Alright, I'm going to let you guys go. I'm happy to hang out with you guys.